so thanks you all for having me here today. My name is uh, Ash Narkar. I am a software engineer at Styra and I'm one of the maintainers of the Open Policy Agent. And I care about developing secure software systems that can be readily deployed, scaled and managed. And we also have with us Madhu. Hey folks, uh, I'm Madhu Keshwali. I've been part of Spiffy Inspire open source project almost since its inception. I Today I kind of like helped out Ash with this demo. So that's the reason I'm here. Thanks, Madhu. Uh, so the agenda for the talk is I'll quickly do an overview of the OPA project, talk about its features. Then Madhu's going to uh, talk about propagating user identity through JOT SWITS. And finally, we'll see a demo of how Spire and OPA are going to work together for OIDC Federation. So let's get started. Uh, so just a quick intro of the OPA community. The project started in 2016 at Styra, where I work. And the goal of the project has been to unify policy enforcement across the stack. OPA has been used in production by many companies for cases like admission control, authorization, RBAC, ABAC, and so on. It's a CNCF project currently at the incubation level. Hopefully, we'll graduate soon. And it has more than 150 contributors on Git, a healthy Slack community of more than 3,000 members, more than 4,000 stars on Git. And it's integrated with more than 20 of the most popular open source projects out there, including Spire, Istio, Envoy, Kubernetes, and so on. So what is OPA? OPA, which is the Open Policy Agent, is an open source general purpose policy engine. When you use OPA, you are decoupling the policy decision making from the policy enforcement. So your services can now offload queries to OPA for a policy decision. So the way this typically works is that imagine you have a service and this can be any service at all. It can be a Kubernetes API server. It can be your own custom service, Kafka, Envoy, whatever. Whenever your service gets a request, it's going to ask OPA for a policy decision by executing a query. OPA is then going to evaluate that query based on the policy and data it has access to and send the decision back to your service where it gets enforced. So you can see the decoupling happening here between the decision making and the enforcement. The policy query itself can be any JSON value. So you can give OPA like the HTTP request method path, the user, if you're doing uh, HTTP API authorization, if you're doing admission control, you can give OPA the entire pod manifest. So give it some kind of structured data and OPA returns a policy decision, which is again a JSON value back to you, your service for enforcement. A uh, few of OPA's features real quick. Uh, at the core of OPA is a high level declarative language called Rego, which allows you to write policy decisions that are more than Boolean, basically any JSON value, arrays, objects, and so on. OPA is written in Go, and you can deploy it as a sidecar host level daemon. It's designed to be as lightweight as possible. So all the policies and data it needs for evaluation are stored in memory. It provides some management APIs, which allow you to fetch policy and data from remote services. It can upload decision logs to remote services and also its status. And finally, along with the core policy engine, OPA provides a rich set of tooling to build, test, and debug your policies. It provides a unit test framework, as well as integrations with uh, IDEs like VS Code, IntelliJ, and a Rego Playground. So now we'll transition to the demo part of the talk, which we'll talk about, in which we'll see how policy decisions are based on the user and service identity. And Madhu is gonna do that demo for us live. But before we do that, I wanted to set up the demo for you all. So what we have, we have a Acme Healthcare, which provides its members a platform to view invoices. And this platform is composed of three services, the front end service, which allows members to log in and see their invoices, an invoice service, which holds the actual invoices. And finally, we have a claim service, which holds the claims, which are part of the invoice. So the way the demo is gonna work is that you're gonna have a user, when the user logs in with the front end service, the front end service is going to authenticate the user via an IDP. The IDP returns a token back to the front end service, which it then forwards to the invoice service. 
the invoice service then asks the claim service for the claims that will be part of those invoices. So the claims are basically like a simple object which contain the status of the claim, the provider, the procedure, and so on. And the invoice service will simply take that claims object and embed it in the invoice object, which looks simply like this, and send it back to the front end service, which will present it in a beautiful way for the user to consume. So this is how the flow of the demo is and how this demo is gonna work. So next, the policy that we want to demo says that users with the role billing manager can view claims in the invoices. Again, the policy, the OPA policy that we will see in the demo says that users with the role billing manager can view claims in these invoices. And so to demo this policy, we are gonna have a couple of users one is Alice and one is John, where Alice is a billings manager and while John is an enrollee. And we will see later how this information is being decoded from the George S. Wids later on in this talk. But again, so we have a couple of users to help us with our demo. And so what you're gonna see is that when Alice logs into the front end service to see her invoices, when the invoice service asks the claim service for the invoices, the claim service will ask OPA for a decision. And so the claim service is gonna send OPA all the JOT tokens and all the JOT SWITs that it needs to make this decision. OPA is gonna validate, verify, decode those tokens. And based on the claims, it's gonna make a decision on whether Alice should see her claims or not. And since Alice is a billings manager, OPA is going to allow this request to go through. And so Alice will be able to see her invoices with the claims in them. On the other hand, if John, who's an enrollee, tries to see the claims, OPA is going to block this because uh, John is an enrollee and therefore OPA will deny the decision. And what you all will see is that although John can see the invoices, the claims will be empty. So now I'm gonna hand it over to Madhu, who's going to do a live demo real soon. And before that, he's gonna talk about propagating user identity to Jot s -Wills. Madhu, take it over. Yeah, uh, thanks Ash. Uh, so essentially what kind of interests me in this particular uh, demo here is uh, every time I talk to folks about identity, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is user identity, right? So, uh, but uh, really, Spire is not about that. Uh, Spire is about service uh, authentication, providing identities to services. Uh, earlier today, uh, Andrew Jessup mentioned about uh, having a, a working group which deals about delegated authentication, uh, which talks about transitive identity. We're still trying to frame that. And I kind of see this as one of the use cases why we need that, why we need a delegated authentication or why we really need a uh, transitive identity. Um, kind of like a more generic use case for this demo is you have, uh, you want to have like a cascaded or a chaining of your identities starting right from where the uh, user authentication happened, right? Uh, think of uh, the front end here uh, as an edge service that is running elsewhere, uh, perhaps outside your infrastructure. Uh, in this demo, this is going to be my laptop. And uh, you're trying to authenticate the user uh, using one of your IDPs, whether it's ping or Okta or something like that, that also gives you a JOT token and you propagate this JOT token as part of your uh, claim uh, request that you're doing to your Spire. And you can think of uh, right now, uh, the only available uh, claim with, that is supported with Inspire is the audience claim. So I'm using, uh, so we are using the JOT as well to be part of that audience claim make that request and propagate all of this through. Uh, why we are doing that is because at the OPA, so this is the application part, why do we need delegated authentication? So at the application, at the authorization server that OPA is, uh, you are able to integrate with the JOX URI and not only validate all of those JOT aspects that are part of that chain, uh, but also extract uh, uh, you know, like the actual claims of that uh, all of this uh, chain that happened, right? Right from the user to the service one to service N and at each individual level, you, you can possibly like uh, uh, validate those uh, from the issuer itself, right? So that's kind of the use case here. 
Uh, let me share my screen here real quick. So uh, in this demo, uh, we have, uh, this is kind of, kind of the UI that is showing the actual uh, deployment. So this is a Kubernetes setup. Uh, we have individual namespaces, Spire is deployed as, uh, uh, Spire agents are deployed as daemon set, Spire is deployed as a stateful set. And uh, along with Spire itself, uh, we also have, if you look at this, um, particular one, we also have uh, the container, the OIDC provider, right? Like, so the OIDC discoverer is running alongside with the Spire server itself. Uh, and we have deployed uh, both the backend service and which has the actual data that is consumed and the invoice service is kind of like the ingress service, if I may call that, which the front end is consuming, right? So uh, over here on this terminal here, I have Alice who is trying to log in to that application. And I have been open this for quite some time here. So I'm trying to log in as Alice, who has a particular uh, profile. So as uh, we see here, we have this billing manager is the actual uh, one of the properties, one of the claims within the Jota suite that was uh, provided by Okta. And that particular user is validated and this is the actual job test with those coming. So we are seeing that OPA is allowing this particular request. So we are able to see the claims information here. But if I log in as the other user, uh, John here, uh, we should not be able to see that. So this is John, he has a different particular role. And if we go to his particular dashboard and try to see the invoices, you see that the claims information, again, uh, this kind of like a overloaded term here, claims in, in the application, this is kind of like the insurance claims, not necessarily to do anything with the JOT claims, but uh, the JOT token itself, you can see that uh, OPA denied information. So this data, the claims, insurance claims data is coming from the backend service and OPA is uh, uh, denying access to that particular uh, user there. So if we actually take a look at this JOT token here, and let me open this up in a different window. So you see that in the audience itself. So that was the information that is coming from uh, the JOT SVID that was issued to the invoice service. Uh, and uh, this particular information audience itself is kind of like the chaining that I was mentioning. So itself is the JOT that was issued by uh, Okta or the identity provider, right? So here we have the information. So at the authorization OPA layer, wherein we are making authorization decision, we are validating both the JOT SVID and also which is part of the audience claim and also the actual JOT SVID of the uh, service itself. And even though the service has allow, we have a policy which uh, only which verifies both the service uh, claim and also the user claim itself. 
So as you can see here, uh, we have this embedded as a claim within that Jardis fit. And uh, because we have the OIDC federation that is done between the OPA authorization server and the Spire server, we are able to like validate this. And also similarly, we can also write a policy, the rego policy, which also can validate the octet jot itself. And uh, we have this particular policy here, and we are verifying both uh, the token and also the actual claims within the user itself and making a decision based on both. So yeah, that's, that's the short demo there. Um, open to take any questions. Uh, back to you, Ash. Uh, great, thanks, thanks, Madhu. Uh, so we do have a question. So how granular can OPA control access? For example, in this demo, what if Billings manager should be allowed to view certain claims and enroll you to view certain different claims? So Jigar, that's a great question. Uh, we can definitely do granular access with OPA. Like I said, you give it any kind of JSON value, your policies can be as uh, granular as you want to. And you can you like it can decode your tokens like the JOT SVID or any other token that we give it. It can verify it using the JOX URI, and then you can write pretty fine grained policies uh, with that. So it's totally possible to do that. Uh, I have one more question here uh, by Najib: Can OPA perform the static analysis of a YAML manifest? So yeah, so there is a separate project in the OPA namespace called Contest, which is uh, for validation of Kubernetes manifests and other kind of different files like Docker files. So yeah, uh, check that project out and it can probably solve your use case. Uh, one more question by Dennis. We've created OPA policies for resources at the record level. Definitely possible. Okay, so thanks, thanks for validating that, Dennis. I appreciate it. Yep. Yeah, so again, thanks you all for uh, inviting us for this talk, for giving us the opportunity. If you have any questions, we'll be here. And thanks to Meran team and this entire SPFE Inspire team. Thank you so much.